I'm Lila Avalovet. I think uh, most of you know me, and I'm the director of the Center for the Study of Social Difference, and I wanted to welcome you to um, what has become something of a tradition uh, in the last couple of years, uh, and started last year when I was away, and that's a series of roundtable conversations <laughs> on keywords. Um, and we try to draw participants together from a wide range of disciplinary homes, uh, and from the various centers um, for whom CSSD uh, serves as a site uh, and support for innovative uh, interdisciplinary and collaborative thinking and research around questions of social difference from race and class, gender, sexuality. And the goal of these conversations is just to uh, see how differently we all think about fundamental critical concepts. I mean, we could think the same way, but it hasn't worked out that way in the past. <laughs> uh, and I am really delighted that we got such a wonderful and distinguished uh, mix of scholars and thinkers to agree to come together today um, to offer their thoughts on this ubiquitous uh, but still very slippery concept of diversity. So thank you uh, for joining us and being here. And I'm going to turn things over to uh, Professor May Nye who's a professor of history and the Lung family professor of Asian American studies here, uh, who's agreed to moderate and introduce. And she's a US legal and um, political historian who's been involved both in CCS, CSSD, we're changing the name, uh, and so we're getting used to the new acronym, mm -hmm. uh, Center for the Study of Social Difference and the uh, Center for the Study of Ethnicity and Race uh, for years. She's someone interested in questions of immigration, uh, citizenship, and nationalism. Uh, she's been involved in the CSSD project on borders and boundaries, uh, and has been a great intellectual and political presence here at Columbia. Um, she's the author of many articles uh, and books, and I love the titles of your books, and now I'm going to go read them. Uh, one of them is called Impossible Subjects, uh, Illegal Aliens in the Making of Modern America. Uh, and uh, the lucky ones, one family and the extraordinary invention of Chinese Americans. And she's now working on yellow and gold. Is that still the case? Um, the Chinese. I'm still working on it. You're still working on it. Yes. <laughs> I mean, it didn't come out since I uh, read this. Uh, right. But it could have come out already, and she'd be on to the next one. Um, yellow and gold: the Chinese mining diaspora, 1848 to 1908, about Chinese gold miners in the North American West, Australia, and South Africa, which uh, sounds amazing. So, May, thank you. Okay, hey, uh, thank you. Welcome, friends. Um, another one of our keywords uh, meetings. These have been great conversations. Um, so we mean to have a brief um, 12 minutes or so comments so we can really have a discussion with everybody. And I think I think this these. The series has been one of the great things about um, CC, CASD, <laughs> whatever. Um, we'll, we'll, get, we'll, get, we'll get the hang of it. Um, I've been to several of these. I, I spoke at, I think, the first one we did last year on ethnicity, and nobody could agree on anything about ethnicity, what it meant or if it was even useful. Um, and then I remember the one I came to on movement, where we had people talk about social movements, and we also had a dance scholar talk about bodily movement. So I'm sure we will have a, a wide-ranging um, comments on the concept of diversity. So I'm just going to introduce. Um, oh, and you know, I'm sure you all read in today's Times. You know, there was an article about the upcoming Supreme Court case, Fisher v. U University of Texas, on where they're going to kill whatever we have left, I think, um, on uh, uh, diversity. Um, so, uh, so very timely. Um, so uh, I'm just going to give short introductions to each of our speakers. Uh, I think I'll do them all together so we can just keep in a flow. Um, and we change the order a little bit so we can give Professor Harris time to catch his breath. <laughs> <laughs> so our first speaker will be uh, Irva Shivad, who is director at the Law School of the Engaging Tradition Project at the Center for Gender and Sexuality Law. Um, it's an exciting project that seeks to understand how the idea of tradition, maybe that would be a good keyword, 
We were uh, going to do tradition, but then we switched to diversity. Okay. Good. Well, we can do that later. Is used, how tradition is used by uh, and used against movements for gender and sexual justice and to explore how tradition-based practices inform, enable, and or limit the work of these movements. Uh, Vaad is former executive director of the Arcus Foundation. She was deputy director of governance and civil society at Ford and former executive director of the National Gay and Lesbian Task Force, uh, where she worked uh, in various roles for over 10 years. And she's also a former prisons, prisoner's rights lawyer. Um, she's the author of Virtual Equality, The Mainstreaming of Gay and Lesbian Liberation, um, Creating Change, Public Policy, Sexuality, and Civil Rights. And, the f and um, she's coming out with a book uh, this year, Irresistible Revolution, that's a great title, Confronting Race, Class, and the Limits of LGBT Politics. Um, she's a graduate of Vassar and Northeastern uh, School of Law. Professor Fred Harris. Um, is Professor of Political Science and the Director of the Institute of Research in African American Studies here at Columbia. He works on Af American politics with a focus on political participation, social movements, religion and politics, political development, and Afro-American politics. He's written Something Within Religion in African American Political Activism, an award-winning book, and also co-author of another award-winning book, um, with Valeria Sinclair Chapman and Brian McKenzie, Countervailing Forces in African American Civic Activism. Uh, he's now working on a book project on the implications of the Obama candidacy for black politics, tentatively titled The Price of a Ticket. Okay. Look forward to that. Um, and <laughs> Professor, <laughs> I wonder how you, you know, how you, how your writing on this changes. It's really hard to work in contemporary issues, right? Not really. Not really. Okay. <laughs> it's it's coming out in June. Oh, okay. Good. In time for the election Watch sales, you. right? Okay. <laughs> and the last. I told them to speaker. delay it till after Obama gets reelected. Uh, <laughs> uh, uh, well, he wants it to come out, right? Yeah. Okay. Can we do um, and Ira Katz-Nelson um, is professor of political science and history. Um, he works on comparative politics, political theory, and political and social history. Uh, he has too many books for me to yeah. read to you here. Um, his most recent are Liberal Beginnings, Making a Republic for the Moderns, and When Affirmative Action Was White, An Untold History of Racial Inequality in 20th Century America. And he's now completing Fear Itself, a book on American democracy from the New Deal to the Cold War, and Liberal Reason, a collection of essays on the character of modern social knowledge. Okay, so we'll start with um, Urbashi, and about 12 minutes, and I'll wave <laughs> when you're at about 11. See the time. Okay, great, thank you. Thank you, May, and um, thank you, everybody. Oh, go up there. Yeah, oh, yes, yeah, sorry. Yeah, yeah. We For the informal yeah, conversation. All right. <laughs> yeah, we'll have it later. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Well, thank you um, for this opportunity. It's really an honor to be with two people who I've read and admire so much. It's, mm -hmm. it's, uh, it's fun to be an activist in an academic setting. Um, you get to pose in a way that you never get to in the activist world. <laughs> no, I mean, I mean it. It's, I, it's been really wonderful to be here. So every time I sat down to think about today's topic, I found myself impatient and irritated and avoiding doing anything to write about it. And I realized that the word diversity actually annoys me a great deal. And it even infuriated me to the point that I couldn't focus on this exercise. <laughs> you know, they say if it's hysterical, it's historical. So I had to ask myself why this annoyed reaction. And I came up with two reasons. First, my experience with the deployment of diversity leaves me cynical about its function and its utility. And second, because too often the deployment of the concept serves to contain and marginalize and co-opt or otherwise absorb the challenge being made by those outside the mainstream. So my experience with diversity comes out of a range of situations running nonprofits, building organizations, building teams of staffs and volunteers and in organizing projects and campaigns and social movements and demonstrations. It comes out of funding initiatives on diversity and philanthropy. It comes out of working in advocacy organizations on public policy and writing public policy and legislation, working on media, fundraising, different contexts. 
In each of these environments, I've used the diversity argument myself many times to question and push for change in the dominant hierarchies of race or gender or class or sexual privilege that I encountered in the environments in which I was working. And my irritation comes out of a frustration with the concept as a mechanism for achieving structural change. Um, it also comes out of living with the backlash that any politics that prioritizes race or for, foregrounds race brings in America. And um, you know, what makes my feelings about diversity so personal, I suppose, is that the myriad experiences that I've had through an accident of birth and a chosen leftist politics of embodying diversity and feeling used and managed by it as a concept and an analytic tool. Whether it's the experience of being the Indian immigrant in a small upstate town in the mid-60s facing the question of whether you lived in a teepee, or the experience of being <laughs> an out lesbian <laughs> happened, 1966, um, or the experience of being an out lesbian in the ACLU in the early 80s, which had a hard time at that time seeing sexual preference, as it was called, as anything bigger than a matter of a First Amendment issue, or whether it was the experience of being one of the only people of color leaders that has so far served in the mainstream LGBT movement, and I've done it for over two decades, or being the only woman in so many tables of moneyed privilege at decision-making tables in the gay movement or in philanthropy, the fact of not being part of the mainstream is a constant and unrelenting lesson in otherness. And otherness gets boring and weary, <laughs> especially if you think of yourself as universal and what passes as universal as a clever magic trick. Um, so three ways I've used the term in my work. At first, I've used it as a moral appeal. Diversity is a good thing. I've used it to persuade those in the dominant group in any particular institution that race or gender or economic issues or sexuality or disability should be part of the agenda. I framed it as an appeal to do the right thing. The institution, the government, the corporation should do the right thing in terms of inclusion of difference because the exclusion or prejudice is wrong. I framed it as a Todd Gitlin-esque common humanity appeal. Diversity is not about having one of each at the table, but knowing that we can carry the interests of each in one, each in ourselves. I framed it as an appeal to move beyond identity. It's about a politics of justice, not about an identity X, Y, or Z. And a justice politics creates avenues for participation and for recognition for a wide range of people. And lately, I've been making the case in the LGBT movement from a very database, social science, nerd kind of argument, <laughs> saying because there's race and, and class and gender diversity in LGBT communities, we need to have a political agenda that reflects and represents people that we claim to represent. It's very social science, and it, and it works for people. A second way I've worked with the concept is to focus on the development of tools, trainings, mechanisms to increase representation and inclusion particularly by race, but also by gender and sexuality and class, on the decision-making bodies of, of, of boards or of staffs of institutions. Uh, we used it, for example, in the 1993 March on Washington, the LGBT movement had a requirement of 50% people of color diversity on all decision-making bodies. And it was structured, all these marches are crazy processes that are fun to organize, but insane, because they are so uh, grassroots and so um, the process of getting 50% racial diversity in Iowa and North Dakota was fascinating and, and soundly criticized as you can imagine because people in those states said this isn't representative of us. So, but um, I've also used it in, on boards um, and just for your information today in the national movement's largest 40 organizations gender parity is at about 30% of boards uh, I'm sorry, 40% of the national boards in those 40 organizations are women. So it's not 50-50. Um, and people of color is probably in the mid-30s. Mm -hmm. I've used it in diversity trainings of boards. We've, philanthropy, as you all know, has invested tons in the question of how do you diversify institutions. Um, but the Urban Institute in 2009 noted that California, which has uh, 58% people of color in its population, that its nonprofits have 28% of people of color on the board, and that nationally about 14% of board members of nonprofits are people of color. 
This is a 2009 study. Um, I've used it, the third way to, that I've used diversity is this uh, ecosystem approach, I call it that. That diverse organizations like biodiversity make life better and make all of our work more successful. Um, and there's four key elements to that that were nicely outlined by Jan Masuaka, who is a fabulous thinker about nonprofit um, issues based in California. And she, you know, summarizes that the four main arguments we use to urge diversity in boards is it, it, it matters as part, sometimes it matters to the organizational's mission. If there's a business case to be made, it's good for business, for the company, that's a lot of it. That it's part of the social responsibility of an organization, and that often if an organization strives to serve a diverse population, it's good to have that diversity on the board. Again, the data disprove, dis disprove that this kind of approach is working because we really haven't diversified many of the nonprofits. So I want to conclude, I mean, I just want to talk about three unintended consequences that these experiences um, have produced that leave me feeling the uneasiness that I started out with. I think a focus on inclusion can actually serve to bleach out a real power analysis. A second problem is that I think a focus on adding race or including even treats difference as if it were a condiment. <laughs> a favor. <laughs> and the third is that the approach, you know, has the effect of re-empowering that which it says it claims to question. And then the final thing that I want to mention, actually, is, that, is the whole question of the backlash. So diversity is bleach, right? Saying things like, we've got to build more diversity in our board actually can leave the conversation about power in those institutions quite unaddressed. You can, after all, add board members by race and gender and class and still keep the mechanisms by which power is held and gained and distributed and organized inside any institution intact. And in, many, in my experience, diversity can become a lovely cosmetic for an institution to say, to cover structural imbalances and how decisions are really made. And it, 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 I say it bleaches out a structural power analysis by enabling things to become focused on identity rather than on material things, which are part, which are connected to identity, but not only about identity, like money, what neighborhood you live in, what school you went to, who your mentors were and whether they're popular, what social capital you have, what social networks you're part of. That's what really, you know, like for example, philanthropic decisions are made a lot on those kinds of factors. There, there really are. Uh, even at wonderfully professional organizations like the Ford Foundation, social capital matter, matters so much more than the idea you're walking in the door with. They won't admit that. Um, at the same time, a focus on diversity and seeing it as inclusion can bleach out the different histories that different forms of ex exclusion bring. So we have a black president, but the racism with which he and his family are regarded and reported and treated reflects the persistence of ideas and logics of white supremacy in America. Both exist. Diversity and inclusion programs in corporate America are great examples of this bleaching effect. Corporate diversity programs proclaim a commitment to workplace equity within institutions, but those institutions maintain their gender and racial hierarchies. And there's a huge amount of literature about the investment of corporations on how to engage inclusion and catalyst and all the different data that's collected on workplace inclusion, talk about how wonderful it is. But you look at the corporate boards, they're only still 16% women. And um, you know, Out and Equal is this huge project in the gay and lesbian community to do corporate diversity work in corporations. And it, it's one of the largest networks that exists in the gay and lesbian movement right now. LGBT corporate employee resource groups, they're called. But I can only name maybe one or two openly gay people on any board or any company that's really taken a position on gay rights issues. Diversity is flavor. You know what I'm talking about. I don't even have to go into that. It's like a flavor enhancer, a spice to add to the flavor of the colonizing powers palette. Diversity as a, a reinforcing the non-diverse category. It's a little bit like the word privilege, which I also have a problem with. You may have talked about it. Because privilege feels like, on the one hand, you're talking, it feels inauthentic. Because we're talking about privilege, but hey, we're also saying we have something that's called privilege that we're trying to undo. 
I feel like diversity restates that there is a norm against which the thing that's being identified as different is in fact different. And it perpetually relegates that difference to a marginal space rather than as the main event. And I have a problem with that. As I, as I said earlier, I think of myself as the main event. Um, <laughs> I always have. Um, so diversity and resentment, a final point, um, and I'll sit down. It would be incomplete to talk about diversity today without thinking about the backlash that all of our efforts to change structural racism and, and gender inequality and sexual and class hierarchies have produced. Um, there are serious movements that are pushing back against all of our efforts. And Jean Hardesty from Political Research Associates nicely named that mechanism by which right-wing populism works as mobilizing resentment. And I, I like that phrase because it captures a lot about how it, the right effectively uses it, but it begs consideration of the deeper political challenge for movements, which is the challenge of resentment, that visceral com combination of longing and envy and anger and aggrievement that comes out of feelings of loss of power and control, feelings or experiences of humiliation, experiences of losing ground in capitalism, experiences of, of violence and whatever that many different kinds of people feel that lead them to feel resentment at somebody else getting ahead when they're losing ground. And I think that as movements, we really have to not just look at the right's effective mobilization of resentment, but think about how we ourselves respond to that feeling of resentment or that sense of um, the emergence of some people as a suppression of others. My favorite, one of my favorite poets said it best, um, June Jordan. She said, there is difference and there is power. And who has the power determines the, determines the meaning of the difference. And so that's why I guess I focus on power more than diversity. And that feels a more hopeful place to intervene and focusing on the processes by which we can organize power. And probably that's why I'm such a lesbian feminist, because I focus on process. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> Uh, apologies again for uh, coming in so late. I had put this on my calendar for four. And so when Sharon Harris, who's the uh, secretary at the Institute, uh, called me and said, where are you? <laughs> I said, well, I'm working on this. Is it. Well, you should get here now because it's starting. So <laughs> unfortunately, my comments won't be as, as lucid <laughs> as yours. But I want to speak on, on a couple of things. First, I do work on the black political experience. So. The, the idea of diversity doesn't really creep into my work and in a very sort of concrete way. Um, but it's, it's mostly historical, um, and it's um, surrounded about issues of social movement and social change, um, and how black communities have been very instrumental in that change. Um, and so when I thought about this topic, I really thought about sort of the lexicon of, of change, of, of difference, of racial difference. And so if we were having this conversation 40 years ago, we wouldn't use the concept diversity. We would be talking about desegregation or integration, which to me um, uh, really talks about institutional transformation or institutional change. And so over time, as, as, as the country has become increasingly diverse, and also because of new claimants, uh, particularly um, uh, adopting some of the language and the legal strategies of the 1950s and 1960s, like the Brown decision, um, 1964, um, uh, the Civil Rights Act, where in, in, in addition to race, there was also color, religion, and as many of you know, gender was thrown in initially as a joke. <laughs> um, and there was a rallying around. Uh, including it um, as a protected category. And of course, 1965 Civil Rights Act. So over time, you know, we've gotten from, you know, institutional change, from integration, desegregating institutions to what you say is this, which I love, uh, this, this bleaching <laughs> of, 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 of difference. Um, and so I was going to talk more in detail about that, but actually I want to go to an anecdote um, to, to think about what we mean today about um, diversity. And so <clears throat> last fall was one of the greatest challenges I've had in quite, in quite a while. Um, it was 
trying to get my four year old, uh, four, four and a half year old kid into kindergarten oh. in New York City. And so, you know, you go to a lot of the, 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 the you know, the, the good public schools and you go to the independent schools and there are all these glossy, you know, brochures about diversity and, you know, lots of brown colored faces on, on you know, on the, on the brochures and you go on, on the, um, you know, the tours and people are talking about sort of diversity. And so when you actually look into the classrooms and, you know, see who's teaching, um, there are not a lot of people who look like me and myself. <laughs> I'll just put it that way. And so in, in many ways, it's, it's, it's to me, when we talk about diversity within some context, it's almost like a publicity campaign uh, sort of thing, where, you know, it's just something that you have to go as a part of the trademark of, uh, or the, uh, the brand um, of the organization. And so um, it sort of raises questions, particularly looking at it from this historical context. The question I begin to ask in this very personal way is that, who is diversity really for, right? Is it for those who are trying to, you talk about power and maintain power? Um, and it's something, not that, you know, my son and I, we, you know, we don't celebrate diversity, we do want difference, but um, it seems that we're getting back, at least within this context and this very personal way of this experience in New York, uh, a situation of like 1954. You know, uh, you know, uh, you know, when the idea was sort of integration, desegregation, and so I won't name the school. So we got into you know a very good school in New York, um, uh, and um, I went to you know the parents' um, luncheon, and you know, over a hundred people there. Um, and the people, the parents certainly didn't look like the, uh, the demographics of, of, of New York. Um, and in fact, when I looked around, there was only other, one other person who looked like me in the room, of a, of a room of, of 100 people. And it was very disheartening. Um, and so, you know, um, and their class that comes into part of this, um, you know, I couldn't tell, but the people look very affluent. Um, <laughs> no, no, well, I decided not, I decided he wasn't going to go there, so. <laughs> for one of those very, and also it's just $40,000, so, <laughs> you know, it's quite a challenge for a college professor, or at least this one, and so, um, so, um, so yes, it's, it's these power dynamics, um, and so diversity for whom, what kind of diversity, um, and so I think these are sort of the challenging issues that we face, not only when it comes to kindergartens, but when it also comes to things like uh, what kind of representation and difference we have in places like low library, for instance, uh, on this campus. And so um, I just want to leave you with that, this thought. These are sort of my, um, I guess I'm a little bit incongruent, um, but this is what I had hoped to write out much more succinctly um, at my four o'clock talk. So, uh, <laughs> uh, so with that, I don't know. Well, first, thanks for having me, and it's a delight to be on this on this panel with colleagues so far not a word I disagreed with, so. Um, I, I have one story to tell I hadn't planned on, but it flows from this, and it's, I'm older than Fred, and my um, twin, 31-year-olds uh, 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 were four, and uh, again, we're at the kindergarten stage, and I will name the school, because um, a long time ago, it was the Dalton School, um, and um, we had just moved to New York, and we looked at Bank Street, looked at a number of schools, and someone said, well, the best academic school in Manhattan is Dalton. So off we went, um, and very elegant. It was a uh, holiday of December season, beautifully decorated, oriental rug on the floor, and a, almost a caricature of a, of a 1850 a version of Dalton uh, uh, interviewed us. Um, and <laughs> after the um, interview, I said, or at the end of the interview, she asked, do we have any questions? And I said, might you say something about diversity? And she leaned forward and said, well, we have many more children now from the west side. Uh, so, 
And I understood that meant people like me, uh, which, which was uh, uh, not part of the uh, tradition. So diversity is a, um, is a word, a capacious, um, haphazard, slack term um, on its own with little clarity or rigor except in context and in situation. And uh, the question is um, how to think about diversity in situation. Um, here's a, a definition of diversity that I took off the web from the University of Oregon. Um, it's headline, definition of diversity. Um, the, concept, the concept of diversity encompasses acceptance and respect. It means understanding that each individual is unique, recognizing individual differences. These can be along the dimensions of race, ethnicity, gender, sexual orientation, socioeconomic status, age, physical ability, religious belief, political belief, and other ideologies. It is the exploration of these differences in a safe, positive, nurturing environment. It is about understanding each other, etc., and be moving beyond simple tolerance to embrace and celebrate the rich dimensions of diversity contained within each individual. As a normative statement, it's fine, um, unobjectionable, but as an analytical um, concept, it's, it's almost meaningless. Um, that is to say, it lists a very long list of potential differences uh, among and between people, a very long list of the way in which individuals might identify, um, and then it says, let's be nice to each other, and that seems to me, and respect each other, and who would object to that? Except that um, that's not exactly the world in which we live, a, a world of hierarchies, a world of power, a world of situations, um, and it strikes me that that simple approach, um, and it is a very simple approach as a kind of normative goal, is both, both fine and not very helpful. Um, on the other extreme, I just recently read some work on colonial America, um, uh, America at 1750 by Richard Hofstadter, um, uh, and then uh, Tocqueville's reflections on um, colonial America, and then uh, post-independence, uh, Gustave de Beaumont on, on, on slavery in America. And they write about an incredibly diverse country, incredibly diverse because it has um, white servitude, black slavery, free labor, um, etc. Diversity, um, uh, extraordinary diversity, and religious diversity, Catholics, Protestants, Jews, um, the most diverse country on earth. Um, but that's not diversity in the sense that the University of Oregon um, speaks of diversity. So the question is, what, what do we do with this term? I, I wouldn't give it up entirely, um, uh, but I would prefer um, I'll make an argument that we should prefer the verb to diversify rather than the noun, diversity, which is the state of, in f of fact of being diverse. Um, uh, that is, is an invitation at best. The noun is an invitation to interrogate circumstances and situations. Um, you could have a, a slave plantation that's diverse. You could have the University of Oregon assuming it lives by its norms being diverse, it doesn't tell you very much to call both diverse. Um, it's an invitation to questions. And the issue is what are the questions? Normatively, I think in situations um, that um, overwhelmingly tend to be not like those um, uh, as empirical matters identified by the definition at the University of Oregon, um, to diversify, to seek to diversify, if we know what we mean by that, that is to create um, diversification not just of um, demography, but of capacity um, and of standing, um, that seems to me to be a normatively good purpose. And then we ought to ask, how do we achieve, how do we get from A to B in particular historical and institutional settings? That's a different kind of question than a more vague um, a normative goal of, of respect and, and, and love for each other's um, differences. Now, the, um, so here then, uh, for me, at the, are, are ways of thinking about situations. Um, uh, situations um, vary um, by demography, um, by the identities of persons um, who compose those populations, by networks, 
um, situations um, are also, and all networks are networks that have uh, relations to power. That is the capacity to identify and fashion hierarchies. Um, and therefore, um, the objects and situations of diversification ought to be an understanding of diversity in the sense of these dimensions of content and boundaries of unlikeness. And they, these boundaries, by the way, shift even in the same place with respect to the same populations. Uh, an example, maybe a small one, but not really a small one. Um, as a graduate student, I studied, among other things, um, uh, matters of um, color, race, in Great Britain. Um, uh, the, the West Indians, um, uh, Bangladeshis, uh, Indians, uh, Pakistanis, um, found in Great Britain um, were all called colored immigrants or commonwealth immigrants. Um, and the, the, the category in which they were considered with was, was race associated with colonial experience. If you go to Britain today, uh, overwhelmingly, um, the Asian uh, uh, migrants, typically the children of those who had come, are not talked about in terms of color at all. They're talked about in terms of religion, um, in terms of Islam. Um, well, how does that shift happen? And what is the meaning of that shift? Was that shift generated from inside or outside? Um, uh, what are its implications with respect to standing and power? What, is it, what are the implications with respect to political coalitions and possibilities? Um, what happened to the racial dimension and color dimension? Is it no longer important? Um, are there issues which, which do, in fact, bind West Indians um, and South Asians together in that circumstance? Or do they no longer bind them uh, uh, together? Um, and so on. Um, so you have um, a diversity of different kinds, but the the nature of networks, the nature of coalitions, the character of power, the meaning of identity, um, all with respect to a, to a roughly stable demographic circumstance, uh, given an end to free migration uh, and entry, um, are all raised by that kind of, um, of case. And these issues of power and networks and identity um, have normative implications as well as uh, empirical ones about the control and ownership and meaning, among other things, of space. Um, an example from research I did a long time ago on, on Washington Heights. Um, I used to ask people, it's mostly in, in the part that in Inwood that was both Irish and Jewish, um, and I found matched blocks where roughly 30% of the people who lived there were Irish, and, 30, and I asked people, whose neighborhood is this? Whose block is this? And you find that each block there was a consensus. This is an Irish neighborhood, or this is a, a Jewish neighborhood. And the only thing that really differed was the placement of religious institutions. If there was a parish church in, in visible view, this was an Irish block. If there was a synagogue, it was a Jewish block. But the demography was, was identical um, uh, in both. But it turns out that had real meaning, political meaning, because when it came to community board meetings and planning sessions, if this was defined as an Irish block, then Monsignor X would be the person consulted as opposed to Rabbi Y. And the nature of construction and, and, and meaning would be altered by virtue of that. Now, just to end of, end of time, um, we need, if we really want to think about diversifying, we have to think about the, nat the nature of settings in which people have experiences of diversity, schools we've talked about, home, work, um, uh, and, and levels of aggregation of space. Um, do we diversify in a university uh, a department, um, a, a school? Um, a, a, what, what are the units which we're talking about? A block, a neighborhood, uh, a city, um, a state, a whole country? Um, and, and, and what are the implications of working at different levels for questions of uh, power, um, the ones that were raised at the very beginning today. And then, what kinds of projects are there that can be mounted for diversification that don't produce bleaching, um, but that in fact um, produce um, uh, a, a mixture of cacophony um, and, um, and music? 
Um, and you don't want pure music Oregon style, because that would be a very boring world. But you don't want pure cacophony either. And the question is, how do we move towards making projects for diversity that can achieve both? And I'll end by saying what I think the right normative goal is for at the level of, of individuals and groups, especially those who have lived um, outside the center of, of, sort of hegemonic definitions of, um, of who counts. Um, it seems to me the issue always is to gain the same level of choice um, that those at the center have always had, i.e. choice about how strongly to value the particularity of the individualizing or segmenting identity um, and, and choice about bleaching if you choose to um, and moving into those uh, the, the core institutions as if you're no different than anybody else. Um, the, the central hallmark of circumstances of oppression are circumstances where people do not have such choices. And then the question is, um, how are those choices arrived at? Uh, what are the terms of that choice? And to use a phrase Tocqueville uh, once used in talking about, among other things, Catholics and their integration in America, uh, how much sacrifice of bonds of memory, the Tocquevillian phrase, is required for entry into um, a world which is not separate, but uh, to use the old-fashioned word, which is integrated, um, but integrated in multiple dimensions. And that's not a simple question. Um, if you think about it in terms of first-year students at this university who come from a variety, sometimes of very diverse and sheltered environments, who have not lived with, for reasons either of choice or not the absence of choice, have not lived with people other than people much like themselves and who look like themselves, um, they face on a daily basis the question of how they manage or what, re what degree of repression um, exists to their own particularity in order to join a collective diversification. Um, those are not easy questions for individuals or for groups. But having a genuine scope for choice um, uh, seems to me to be at least the normative goal um, that, that we should have. And it's a goal that cannot be achieved without attention to the kinds of issues we've already heard about, especially questions of power. Thank you very much. see if I can sort of pull them together a little bit. So the first response I have is maybe the key word should have been normative as opposed to diversity because it does seem to me that the, that the problematic here is that whatever it is that we're calling diversity is defined against something. And here I think about Adrian Rich You know that essay that everybody in women's studies uh, reads. There's a timeline now blocking, but about heteronormativity, where she sort of invokes the compulsory compulsory heterosexuality. Thank you. Um, uh, but you know where she evokes the notion of a, a, a heteronormativity, a sexual normativity, as a way of understanding what it is and how to situate oneself uh, against it. So the diverse becomes what is not normative. And it, it strikes me both, you know, listening to Fred ask the question, who is diversity for? Well, really, in some ways, it, it is it's designed to maintain the normative as we use it. So whether it's designed to maintain it by bleaching out the differences so that the minority remains powerful, or whether it's designed to maintain it uh, by denying choice, as uh, Iris says, 
it does seem to me that one can't have this conversation without asking the question of what sustains a normative? How, you know, how is how is power so constructed either around identity or around class or around color, whatever it is, so that somehow that becomes the thing that um, you know against which everything else gets itself measured, and that's the thing. I can I jump in and just to follow it because it's just the same. I mean, it's interesting because as you're going, oh, everybody's going on. I thought, yeah, we're not. We, there's no argument here. <laughs> <laughs> but there's something. I mean, and I, the, then the question was, why isn't there an argument here? Um, and I, I think it's perhaps, although maybe in the crowd there's a good argument to have that if we think about the history uh, uh, in which this idea of diversity emerged. The history in which the idea of diversity emerged in the US was the uh, history of the liberal politics of recognition as a way of solving a systemic legitimacy crisis. And you know, it, we can think of this globally, right? So you have the anti-colonial movements uh, putting into crisis um, the narrative of civilization as legit, and then you have the new social movements, and at stake when these were, if I wouldn't say normativity, I don't of normative, I don't care, <coughs> like transformation, like fundamental yeah. transformation of a, a of a system that itself was emergent and mobile. And I think at least a lot of folks in the front table, and maybe some folks in the back, think, yeah, uh, that's right. And the liberal politics of recognition, the shift to tolerance of difference was a way of, of reversing the problem of legitimacy that had been addressed to liberalism as such and turning it into a problem of legitimacy addressed to the diverse people claiming supposedly they want to be a part of the table when they didn't want, they want to change the table, they want to blow up the table. So, so what surprised that diversity has these functions, it is itself an effect of a very interesting, very um, massive uh, 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 way of s solving a historical legitimacy crisis that's absolutely 50s, 60s, 70s. And boom, in the 70s, after those 50s, mm -hmm. and you can globalize it, you get the 70s, in which we start having all the debates about it should just be tolerance, worth, it should be inclusion, et cetera, blah, blah, blah. So, how do we have a conversation about the historical origins of this shift and how it gets? Yeah, yeah I'm not sure if yeah. it's normative or transformation or what it is, but that seems to me what's it say? Co-optation. Co-optation, or um, but it's really subtle too. It's, very subtle. it's conscious. Uh, Lila, yeah. Yeah. Then we'll come to the yeah. No, I really appreciate this, and actually, one of the reasons we wanted Ira here was thinking about having you talk about tolerance. I mean, I think when we originally brought up the idea of inviting you to be part of this, but we didn't use that as the key word. But I thought diversity yeah. was something that had built into it that Oregon, University of Oregon definition. <laughs> you know, uh, it was beyond tolerance. Beyond tolerance. So, uh, well, that's just uh, so there's that kind of liberalism. Yeah. But the other thing, just to come back to things that you said, you know, the deep, this term isn't it has had very specific uses in institutions. Uh, and I always thought of it as a euphemism because you could talk about affirmative action. It's not legal anymore to do so. So then that word, for all of those of us who are critical of it as a term, mm -hmm. have to use it so because got, otherwise so it's against the law. <laughs> you can't say, you know, we. You know, uh, so that was my understanding when we all sat on the diversity yeah. committee in the library, trying to figure out what to do here, that nobody believed in it as tolerance or inclusion, but here was the way to change the institution. And this was the only tool we had now that was legitimate and the trustees might give us millions of dollars for, you know, so there's some, so that's the situatedness of the term, and you've seen it situated, yeah, you know, each of you talk about 
how it's situated. So I want to, I, I, I really would like some help thinking about the larger. But see, if we think of it as a tool, which I think is a great yeah. idea, mm -hmm. then then it's a tool. And how do you, if you think about the tool, then what are you doing with the tool? Yeah. Do you use the tool as it's given to your hand to keep building the house, or do you use the tool mm -hmm. to jam it? Yeah. And that's the yeah. only real question on the table. Jam it or build the house? Jam you can it or build or... What? Well, you can answer any of this, uh, <laughs> including but not limited to this. But the question again is, I don't, it doesn't matter how many tools you have, uh, if the foundation is still intact. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. Your tools. You I mean, this is all your Lord, kind of yeah. right? Yeah. And so, um, so you know, so what are the consequences of that, right? But also, this what you um, <coughs> speak of is the politics of recognition. I think is very interesting. Mm -hmm. um, it's, and, and mostly because, you know, claimants from all of these diverse groups want to be recognized, right? And, and it's very important. But the, 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 the process, of, not, not just the process, but the existence of recognition, what sort of ideological um, reinforcement it, it has um, for those groups? And also, does it really blunt their vision of what transformation should be about because they have the recognition? So that's, I, want, I just want to put that on the table. That's right. No. Right. Yeah, it, I mean, these are immensely complicated, rich questions. Um, they start with at the, the question of tool, um, which has come up. Uh, I said I preferred the verb diversification, or to diversify, um, uh, to diversify as a verb, rather than um, Diversity as a as a crisp enough word to describe where we are, um, and then the question is, what do we mean by to diversify? And then all the issues yeah, um, right. come up, including what is normative and what is not. Yeah, so but that's the where the where the where the, where the focus and debate ought to be. It is worth um, I uh, I have a slight reservation in um, too thick and unitary a use of the word liberal. Um, uh, yeah, of course, no, just, just because, uh, remembering that if we think from Du Bois through Martin Luther King Jr. and so on, the, 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 the central issue was how to, how to secure membership in the status of liberal citizen. Um, not the only thing at issue, but without civic standing, not, they understood and rightly understood that nothing else could follow as a strategy of, 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 of power. That is to say, unless you had civic standing, uh, unless persons had civic standing, then exclusions from physical space, um, issues of physical security, issues of material rights to earn a living, and issues of cultural expression, um, uh, which challenge normative centrality and, and, and explode uh, the cultural category, none of that could happen, that in a kind of, um, lexical hierarchy uh, was critical to, um, to obtain civic standing, what essentially is a, is, um, uh, a polity based in its ideas, not in its practice, on um, government by consent, rule of law, etc. So th th that's not an ideological statement that we should believe that each of those categories is operating as described. But it is, as an empirical matter, um, a way to talk about um, critical parts of social movements which were incendiary in their own terms. Because the membership question, uh, the very membership question, not even what happens after you get membership, but the membership question itself was the source of the greatest amount of violence in American history, um, all through the, to the present, um, in, 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 but certainly at the, at the high points of civil rights struggle or um, period uh, after Reconstruction and so on and so forth. So that's a long-winded way to just say that. But one word about toleration. Um, to, I, I would I define, not originally, would define toleration as a circumstance. Um, I prefer toleration to diversity as a verb, a, a, as a noun. Um, toleration is a circumstance where A has power over B, where A dislikes B. And for whatever reason, A does not use its power to inflict harm on B. Um, absent toler now that's a long way from what I, a world I would like. It's a long way from anything like mutual respect and toleration, let alone a change to the normative center of things, because it 
you have A and B, and A's got power. But absent toleration from the kit bag of things, we live in a, in a much more horrific world, because most of the time, in most places, uh, you have lots of circumstances where A's have power and don't like B's, and they do things to B, which are uh, deeply unpleasant. Um, uh, so, uh, therefore, I would not give up the term toleration, even knowing its limits, and the limits are profound. Um, but sometimes we need a heterogeneous kit bag of tools in order to achieve something that looks more just. I was trying to very much speak from the experience of changing, trying to change institutions and governmental practices, which is where I've used the term. And um, so in, that, in those realms, I think the difference between the noun and the verb actually, while it's really interesting, um, doesn't work for me because to diversify is different from reconstructing. And a lot of times what I was trying to say is that my experience is that good projects which have had good results in terms of changing the compositions of staffs right. but and transform. boards haven't really yeah. transformed the content yeah. of what those groups are working on yeah. or, or you know, produced, oh, which enough. would be a yeah. more reconstructive project. Right. And gets to sometimes it isn't you know much as I'd like to be the person smashing the table of power. Yeah. A lot of times you're the person trying to just Not get those tables of power to do different things. Sure, that's and that I really believe in. I mean, otherwise I wouldn't be a lawyer. And um, <laughs> you know, it, it's it's possible to do that, but only if you keep a real clear-eyed focus on uh, representation isn't enough. You know. And yes, we're using the master's tools, but I don't believe in unilateral disarmament. <laughs> right, right, that would be something. Build a bigger tool. Right? <laughs> 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 I like that, they've got the arms, I'm going to use that. Utopian. Yeah, yeah. 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 Utopian, yeah. Yeah. Um, It's interesting that we've been using the, the concept of power, but I haven't heard us talk about inequality. Mm -hmm. Um, which I think is more specific and is has more to do with the historical um, basis of how we got from affirmative action to diversity. Right? Affirmative action is aimed at reducing you know, eliminating inequality right, through affirmative steps. Diversity, you know, for whose good it becomes very vague and in fact and in fact is most legally is, is grounded in the idea that it's good for the mainstream to have different people around so they get a better education. Right? Right. It's good for white kids to have some colored kids because they get a, they get a more rough, well-rounded education. So the beneficiary of the project completely changes. Yeah. Um, and then what you do for that then doesn't have to address structural questions such as um, the impoverishment of public school education in the cities, right? Which is why, I mean, either there aren't enough black kids going to college, good colleges, because they're just dumb, or because there's something wrong with the entire educational system, right? And you can, you have to believe one or the other. There isn't a lot of room for, you know. I mean, so I think, um, I think while we we we're stuck with this concept legally. Right. I think um, we need to be more creative in terms of how to articulate it in a way that gets back to what's important. Because if you can't solve the K-12 problem, you know, now all they're, they're trying all these different um, uh, strategies to achieve diversity, right, which are now coming under also greater legal scrutiny, right? This is the, the case that's now before the Supreme Court. Mm -hmm. But none of none of this talks about how to improve education, so you have a different kind of um, footing in terms of, uh, you know, so, so what you have doesn't look like it's just compensatory, right? Or reverse discrimination. So I wonder maybe we could talk a little bit about how we can use the, the, what were the tools that we're, we're, we're stuck with to push it a different kind of agenda. Because the recognition stuff or the multi-culti stuff, you know, it's <laughs> it's a, you know, it's not bad, but it's certainly not what we're really fundamentally interested in. At least I'm not. So I had a comment. Uh, 
I, well, I'm, I'm, I'm an administrator, so. Introduce <laughs> <laughs> yourself. Uh, my, my response is, and, and actually it's interesting being here today because I knew that some time while this presentation was going on today, there was going to be an announcement coming out from the president of the provost's office announcing a, a $30 million commitment to further enhancing faculty diversity. So, um, actually, I, I was wondering, when would it hit? For which speaker? Right what moment? 12.56, <laughs> right it was I-Ride. Oh, was it I-Ride? I've been waiting for this. That's right. Coach was promised it, right? Yeah. So the, yeah. the, the um, it. It, 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 mm -hmm. it, it, is, it is actually fascinating to hear this in, in light of, you know, the, the what I, I think the university is trying to do it, and it very much is, I also should say I work a lot with demographers, so, <laughs> so to, to be on, be, uh, to, to have um, two foci in the game. The, uh, demographers do head counts, and, uh, the, the, and, and I, I, I hear the argument very much that you know, representation is not enough. I think that's you know, the, the major for us. Um, but it, it, it feels necessary. Uh, and I think that's probably why the university continues to to go at it. Uh, and th these are not intellectual comments in the extent of what are what are we up to here, and how did how did we how do we have to get to this spot of having to make diversity supplemental in the institution? Uh, but they there there is there is and actually as I was thinking about it, I think in some ways. Universities are have some differences. It, they're, they're like getting more partners in a law firm. I think that uh, they faculty members, tenured faculty members, have some uniquenesses that other organizations don't quite have. And if you can enhance the diversity, uh, be it by gender, by race, ethnicity, uh, whatever. What I can't remember how many dimensions we <laughs> had. There was there was lots. Yeah. Um, that there is that there is power in being tenured faculty members at an institution. Uh, in, in it's it's it, it, the t the power at the level of low library can go up or down on a some some basis, and we recently saw it go down pretty significantly in a, in a very short term. But at the level of the faculty, that feels it feels just feels right. <laughs> uh, it's. It's it's not enough, but it's it sure seems necessary. I, I was a student at this university, and standing much higher than the median um, uh, member of the class. They were not a cross section of, as it were, Black American. Um, the um, uh, there were in the faculty um, very few Catholics and very few Jews, um, even in the in the early in the mid nineteen mid late nineteen sixties. Um, so, in, in the sense of representation, um, some things do get better and change, and they are the necessary condition for all the other, for the, for the other transformational things to happen. Absent that form of representation, um, it seems to be a hopeless idea to think that. So, th then the question is, what do we mean by the verb to diversify? Mm. It doesn't just mean representation. It means to take up those questions of networks and, and capacity um, and inequality and power, um, uh, and, but from a basis that has, which is, which is the opposite of what you describe of that room of 100 people mm -hmm. and only one other person or a family like yourself. Mm -hmm. um, it would matter a lot if there were 15, or I don't know what the right, there's no right number, but uh, it, it, there are threshold numbers in which um, Sandra Dale Connor knew the number was not one. Well, it's not. But, but the, the, the very um, uh, texture of possibilities alters. Um, now that's a long way from from doing from altering. No, I no, I'm of course yes, of course it's greater than one. Of course it should be whatever it is. Yeah, yeah, of course we should put thirty we million call dollars it in. Critical yeah. Whatever it is, yeah, yes, throw it all in. But the point right. is, and especially if we think, Ira, it's really interesting if we think about the historical relationship between what we call democracy, liberal democracy, and what we call capitalism that was happening at the time. That the question of just 
getting, becoming part of a civic, becoming a civic member in the 50s and 60s was in fact a radical idea and was strongly opposed by many parts of the, this country and others to the relationship between democracy and capitalism now in which it's increasingly clear, representation, sure, have all the representation you want because it does make a damn bit of difference. <laughs> uh, governments are assigned by the markets and if you really think they're not, then look at, well, Monty and Green, when push comes to shove, right? And I think a lot of people say, yes, on the one hand, sure, yeah, absolutely, let's keep on trying to be civic members. But there's also an increasing understanding that perhaps that form of governance relation to capital is not neither the first nor the last step to right to, right, to rethink power right now. But if you but if you get to Rashid's statement, in fact, it may be the opposite. In, in other words, diversity may yeah. in fact inhibit trends. Yeah, yeah, exactly. That's what I'm saying. saying. And that's I think yeah, it's the issue. The cover. Democracy raised, is increasingly right, a cover. Is it? So, you know, do you so they look like they're at the table. Of course, but you know, think capitalism. Then the increased representation that we do see, right? Not enough, but that we do see in <laughs> positions of leadership, corporate boards, tenured faculty, administrators, um, philanthropy. Um, do you think that reflects another kind of diversity, which is a kind of growing middle class, educated class within historically? subordinated Absolutely. groups, yes. and then you have a kind of, um, uh, so you do actually have progress, if you want to call it that, right, or increased mm -hmm. participation, or seat at the table, but whether or not the people not in that socioeconomic yeah. position actually actually That's benefit so. is big questionable. Question. It's yeah. a big question, things, right? Things so, can get radically better and worse at the same right, time. Right, right. So well, we yeah. have That's a bigger right. middle class, it, but right. you also Thank have, man. you know, really Structural and disempowerment. unemployment and disempowerment at the same time. And you have a, I'm sorry, and you also have a rhetoric that sort of says that, you know, these people have made it, so why can't you? Exactly. There's no more racism, it's, it's post racial. Right, and yeah. so it doesn't attend to sort of the structural right. issues that many of us are concerned yeah. about. And I guess I would say the university should be applauded yeah. for doing yeah. anything yeah. in this space yeah, yeah. to change historical yeah, yeah. yeah. patterns <laughs> of, of absence. Yeah. It should be applauded for that. At the same time, I wouldn't stop at the applause yeah. because you can you can change, you can you know throw uh, the, the money on the table, but where are these positions going to be? Who are the people who are selected? Are they go along get along people? Are they real change agents? How much power does the person have? I mean, you know, I used to always say to, to uh, friends running organizations that were talking about trying to change their boards, don't just bring on one person of color, yeah. bring on five at a time in one class so that suddenly people aren't like the one person, the one family in the room, but there's like a bunch. And even if, and bring on people that are kind of in relationship to each other already. So uh, there's so many factors that you can engineer in, in creating meaningful diversity versus um, a and kind don't of punish formulaic. This, yeah, don't punish the spaces that actually have been doing a good job. Mm -hmm. For instance, our department, for all its problems, no, for all its problems it's with which we <laughs> anthropology. We can't get, we couldn't get a, what is it used to be called, a hire of, uh, target, target, of target of opportunity. Because yeah. we're actually fairly, yeah. we're pretty good actually, mm -hmm. if you yeah. look around our thing. Yeah. So our department won't be able to hire yeah. for the next 20 years, because A, we won't get a normal hire because it's frozen. Yeah. And B, all the other hiring will go yeah. to departments that are already that have been, been very bad. Mm -hmm. That have been very bad. <laughs> and so part of it sits there and thinks, <laughs> so that's the other thing that's really interesting. Why not, yes, di diversify the places that need to be, but not punish those folks right. who have been working very hard. Working very hard. That's a bad work my friend says. <laughs> yeah, so as an as administrator, I want you to take that back to your people. <laughs> hey, Alice, we, wanna, we are uh, part of your people. Alice, oh, right. one we last many of us uh, sat on at the table. I know. Okay. I know. Yeah, I, I mean, I'm, mm -hmm. I'm still sort of troubled by the diversified from what. So when I look at your department and I see, yeah, you know, there are different mm -hmm. colors. No, what, what about if we thought about class in terms of your department? What about 
we saw about. Yeah, we got some. Yeah, we got some. Right. Right. I mean, we yeah, actually right. But we never tried. Okay, we no, never no, tried. No, right. right. yeah, right. 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 We are, I would like to say, we're exactly right. 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 But, but you're well, right. You know, it, we, and it may well, we it may well be <laughs> that that's not the issue. But, mm. but it still does seem to me that if the notion of diversifying assumes embedded within that notion yes. is a concept of what you're diversifying from. Yeah. What, and as long as that notion is shifting sand, you're playing identity politics with the notion of diversity. So, you know, you've got bits and, you know, I represent this group and that group and the other group mm -hmm. and satisfy even and do a good job on this group, that group and the other group but you still haven't challenged the core of power, if you like, yeah, or good. the engine of transformation, you know, if I can use that yeah. parallel. And that's what bothers me about the notion of diversity. I, I share the cynicism. I think that the word itself is a way of making you know, people feel better. And I don't know how, I mean, I can give you a dozen sort of, per, so, you know, I'm a kid, a, a child of a refugee family in wartime Britain. Uh, and as we, my two brothers and I, tiny children, three, four, five, six years old, walk down the street, uh, the other kids are throwing stones at us, we, literally stones, setting dogs on us. We don't look different, but we're speaking a different language. I mean, you know, where, what's the diversity, right? Where's the diversifying from what? We look the same. We even have reasonably educated parents. And they had, although they don't, they're, you know, a reasonable standard of, you know, in other words, they act the same. But the language divides them. And I'm, I'm thinking that how do you, you know, how without a conception of, you know, a, a you know, sort of melded, I mean, I know normative is the wrong word here, and I don't want to keep using it, but I do think this concept of diversity is a, such a slippery notion that, you know, and I, and I think when universities use it, they're using it to get, get themselves off the hook, not to do a real, and I think what you're bringing up, final comments. I think what you're bringing up is some um, sort of the question of to what end is all of this happening, and okay. to what end yeah. is I mean, it's another way to say yeah. diversity. But and I think that um, that's why I see. I think the more interesting places to focus are on questions of um, what some people would call the end state <laughs> of all of our work and how you create construct processes that enable a lot of different kinds of people to pr promote their own vision of that end state. Pluralism, um, another form of diversity that's often disparaged. Um, and that's, I hear the critique, I see the smile, I've read your work, <laughs> I get it, but I'm still using it because I'm trying to find mechanisms as an organizer to encourage uh, maximal input into that end state. The other thing I'll say is, sort of random points, there is no perfect state of diversity or inclusion. And uh, I, my, my partner Kate and I often joke that our favorite, most lasting auditory memory of the 1970s and being feminists in the 1970s and lesbian feminists is the sound of folding chairs widening in a circle. <laughs> Opening <Wow>. the circle. <laughs> wow. <that>? Inclusion. <laughs> right? Well, always widening the circle. And that was such a focus that that became the focus. And you can see it in the LGBT oh. movement where you're constantly widening the circle with the names LGBTIQAA. <laughs> and, and I love that. I actually. There's a profound acceptance of that kind of consciousness that there will always be somebody coming in the room going, but what about me? Yeah. And I like that. You want to create that space. You want to have that person feel empowered in the room to be able to stand up and say, what about me? 
You want to have them be heard, which is the recognition part. No, I'm not for recognition. Oh, well, I'm saying I am. I mean, no, I'm just saying that you can't add without, you, as but, long as you're fine, that this is going to extinguish this vision of always pluralizing, I just think it's madness. But, but the, <laughs> okay, and I'm just saying, final point is that then that brings me to the problem that I have with it is my own vision is then there are people who are always feeling excluded. So this, that whole thing about resentment, I mean, politically, as a social movement person, I gotta figure out how to deal with resentment of those people who are feeling pushed by my presence. I mean, you know. Yeah, but they've been pushing a lot. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But, but, I, but I have this kind of, Killing I don't know. Everything's okay. dying. There you go. Yeah. Well, well, I mean, not to throw in something else, but I was struck by something uh, Ira said earlier in his talk about the bonds of memory and, and Tocqueville, which I interpreted as, I'm not sure, that one has to give up memory in order Tocqueville to was reporting that um, groups in America, like American Catholics, mm -hmm. whom he said were m far more accepted in Protestant America than they were in Protestant Europe, where mm -hmm. Catholics had been killed. I mean, there's mm -hmm. a war between Protestants and Catholics. But that, that, had, that had meant implicitly that American Catholics were going to move their Catholicism closer to, to Protestantism than was true in the European continent. That there was a price to be paid mm -hmm. in what he called bonds of memory. Mm -hmm. So you end up with, let's call it a more liberal church or a more Protestant church than was true in the center of Europe at the same time. Right. And um, from Tocqueville's point of view, that was a, a net plus. Because in France in the 19th century, uh, the conflict between Republicans and Catholics was such that it was a, a war of all against all. Um, and he saw that in America, um, adjustments made mutually were creating a terrain in which Catholics could continue to be Catholics, but they weren't the same Catholics. Right. And the Protestants weren't the same Protestants. Wow. But that also raises deep questions yeah. about the erasure or, or right. bleaching of difference. difference. Yeah, right, right. Yeah. But not only difference, but um, something that May uh, raised a, um, a moment ago about the groups within the, a, a group within the groups who have gained recognition and that how does memory play within that context um, for them uh, and particularly when we think of the nation state how their memory gets interpreted as part of the national memory and how does the national memory uh, articulate sort of what's happened with the group and how it's come from where it has and sort of what that has on sort of social movements movements for change to continue if that erasure takes on. And so this, this is part of the price, the consequences mm -hmm. of, of recognition. Right, especially when we have a totalizing market economy where the guiding ethos is, I got more in it, right. forget you. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, last, you get the last word. <laughs> 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 because we're really running out yeah, of time. That's a privilege. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, very brief word. It um, seems to me that, that there are the, just two points. First, um, let's not assume that that all the troubles or the problems um, lie with those with a lot of power always or in dominant positions. We live in a world where civil society often transmits through the very mechanisms of voting, public opinion, um, journalism, uh, article, quite ugly things, uh, um, uh, anti-diversity. Um, that is to say, it's not as if America, 300 million people in American society, whatever the right number is, are all um, uh, lusting for um, equal recognition, um, diversity, and so on. That there's there's trouble um, in the world, um, which uh, sometimes people with authority have to grapple with, um, and they do it for better or for worse. Um, so I think it's a just we've talked not at all about the. Um, what it looks like bottom up right now, and the pressures, political mobilizing, social movement pressures, sometimes on the right, which are very powerful, and if anything, um, even self-consciously are anti-diversity and for strengthening normative privileges. Um, second, and, and, and last thing I want to say is that for, for individuals and groups who experience life at the frontiers of um, inclusion and potential capacity to demand transformation. Um, three sets of issues, seems to me, and this would be true of the 19th century immigrants as well as um, uh, racialized minorities today, 
um, face very similar puzzles. Um, one is the bonds of memory question, which is what, what kinds of choices are required in order to enter, whether it's in dress, or in speech, uh, in cultural expression, uh, in networks, in uh, friendship patterns, uh, and, and, and so on. There's a second set of question which has to do with responsibility or feelings of responsibility for those um, uh, who are in the who don't from the same who look like you, but and, and um, who have the same background as you, but who have not even come close to the frontier of uh, of entrance. What what if anything is the degree of responsibility, um, and and that set of issues and its anxiety. Um, charge set of issues it doesn't go away and and third are a, a set of issues for those even more distant that is to say how far does one's identity geography extend um, is it just for the group in this country or this university uh, or, or what have you um, or is it is it national or is it global um, what does it mean for a, a, a a second generation Mexican in um, California or Arizona, um, what are the, what's the sense of connection or obligation, not just to people in California who are not at the threshold, but people on the other side of the border? Um, and which borders? Um, and, and your own work, for example, on, um, on the global networks and movement dimensions of people often sharing the same occupation, but in very different places raises all those questions about what constitutes the, the scope and networks of a wider um, a set of, of responsibilities and relationships. Mm -hmm. And those questions don't go away. Those are permanent questions. They will be permanent no matter what degrees of successful transformation um, we arrive at, because we'll never have an all or nothing solution of a, a good kind like that with a switch. And I think as, as scholars, as well as, as citizens, um, we got to be attentive to those and try to think harder about them in a way which then gives guideposts for people who want to think in their own lives about how to, uh, what the repertoire of options uh, really is. Thank you, Thank you very much. Do we have another round table this semester? We don't. Oh, this, this is it. This, this was our spring. Thank you for us. Fabulous. 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 Fab